Okay, you're on camera. All right, I'm on camera, he says. So, um, we're going to get started here pretty soon. And um, I'm hearing some sort of an echo from my own phone. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have a lot of technology going on here, and we, all of this is props to Dave Brown, who, Brown who, who I said two weeks ago, could we do this? And he's like, oh, let me think about it. Oh my gosh, hours and hours and wonders of science and all that. So anyway, we're streaming this live on Facebook. We're about 15 minutes earlier than we said we would, but that's okay. We're, it's the first time doing this, and we're going to do it again next week, we hope. And uh, so... It, it, we ask people who, who are watching this uh, at home to post questions, and I'll try to monitor that. We have a microphone for questions. I'm, if, you, if you ask a question of Barb after or during the presentation, I'm, she'll just repeat it you know, to the audience or you can go to the mic. So today, uh, Barbara uh, Braun Resco, who has two master's degrees, one in theology, and we know that because she leads our our morning prayer services beautifully and she has a master's degree from the University of Chicago School of Social Work and practices in that field at the uh, University of Toledo Physicians Pain Management Care and that's a fairly new job but she's had a long history in mental health and addiction recovery. There's a lot of great science about trauma and how it affects all of us and how how important it is for teachers, parents, grandparents, um, all kinds of people to think this way, especially about children, but about ourselves, and about also what can help, what can mitigate, what helps us thrive in spite of having uh, terrible experiences that are quite harmful to people. We know that. So Barbara's going to talk to us and we'll have questions and we hope to bring her back in the fall because this is, you know, it's a big area and it has such great implications for all kinds of things. So, okay, Barbara, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, as Sarah said, I have been working in the mental health field for over 10 years now, and not long after I started in the mental health field, I started trainings about trauma. And I started seeing more and more how important they are. And I, at, through my job, I would often hear stories from people, and I was starting to see how those stories affected, from their childhood, affected them even into adulthood. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that happens, and what we can do about it, and how it might affect us as a church, and how it can make us a better community if we are more aware of this. So can everyone hear me okay? All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had a cold last week, so I'm still a little, but I'm fully vaccinated. <laughs> All right, um, so this.
So. There we go. Okay. Hopefully we have sound now. And as Sarah said, if, you, if you're watching at home and you have questions, please put a message in the Facebook feed and she will let me know and I can respond. I'm going to ask that, um, for the most part, I'm going to kind of save the questions till the end, um, just so that I, there's a lot of information that I want to get through. So, um, <clears throat> so the first part is understanding trauma. So this is really just about making sure we all have sort of the same language when we're speaking about trauma. Because I think um, we all have our own experiences and that influences how, what we think of as trauma or what would be a traumatic experience. So there's three things to remember when we are um, talking about trauma. The first is the underlying question should be what happened to you. Instead of what's wrong with you, you want to think what happened to you. Um, symptoms, the symptoms that we see that we'll get into more detail with, um, is more about, we see symptoms like people being very reactive, people losing their tempers easily. Those are all things that are symptoms of trauma. They're not necessarily just that person being unreasonable. And healing happens in relationships. And I think that that is more, pro more obvious or understood now after the past year, year and a half that we've had, where we haven't been able to have those in-person relationships as much and we've seen how that has affected us. And having good, healthy relationships can help heal trauma. So I wanna show a quick clip just to sort of emphasize this. Um, so let me pull this up. This is from one of my favorite Episcopalian social workers who does lots of research in shame, guilt, vulnerability, and so many other things. She's actually uh, spoken at the National Cathedral. You may have seen some of her TED Talks, uh, Brene Brown. Okay, it's not. Can you drag it over? Hang on a second. Sorry, technical difficulties. This is our first time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hang on. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you know, I'm down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. 
John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. And I just, I think that's such a great clip and it really summarizes empathy and how helpful and healing it can be. Okay. Oh, seriously. Sorry, I'm just talking to the computer because it's frustrating me. <laughs> okay. So, let's get through here. Three things to remember. So then we're going to talk about what is trauma. So this is the framework that we use to understand it. And this is based on a definition that was kind of um, formed by SAMHSA, which is, um, and I should always look up what this acronym stands for before I talk about it, because I always forget. But it's Substance Abuse and Mental Health Something Association, or some, it's a federal uh, agency that study substance abuse and mental health. So I apologize for, I, there's too many acronyms in this field and it's just really hard to remember them all. Um, so they have, the definition kind of boils down to what we call the three E's. So <clears throat> the first E stands for events. So individual trauma results from an event or a series of event, events or a circumstance. So it's not necessarily a one-time thing that happened that you're like, oh, that was so traumatic. Sometimes it can be living a year through a pandemic. So the next is experiences. So that is, that is experienced by, how is this experienced by an individual, physically and emotionally? And it's harmful or life-threatening. So somehow you feel like your life or your well-being is threatened by this event or situation. And then we look at what are the effects. The effects are lasting adverse effects on an individual's functioning, which includes mental, physical, um, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So the three E's, as I said, is the focus of events places the cause of trauma in the environment, not in some defect in the individual. This is what underlies the basic understanding of trauma-informed care. It's not, what, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. I'm gonna probably say that a few times this morning. <clears throat> the focus of, so events or circumstances. The focus of experience, it highlights the fact that not every child or, or adult will experience the same events as traumatic. So you may know that somebody, you may know somebody, you may experience the same thing as someone else and you may be fine, but they may not be. And we never, it's, there's a lot of factors as to why that happens and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's important to remember that every event is experienced differently by each person. And then effects, okay, come on. Um, <clears throat> the effects is the identification of a broad range of potential effects. So we have to remember that one person's response to a situation isn't um, the same as another person. So, okay, so this is a little confession. I'm slightly obsessed with true crime. And a lot of times we hear these stories about how someone responded to someone else's death or that they're missing, and they're like, well, they must be guilty because they weren't crying or they weren't showing a certain um, emotion that we would expect someone to show in this situation. And the fact is, everybody responds to trauma differently. So just because someone maybe seems devoid of emotion in a moment doesn't mean that they are guilty or that they're not having feelings, but some people's response to trauma is that they do what we call disassociate or shut down. And so that's how they have learned to manage their trauma and manage difficult situations. So while somebody might cry and 
wail in a situation someone else might go sit by themselves and not say anything and seem emotionless. So potential traumatic events. So this is just uh, a, um, this is not an all-inclusive list. So I'm sure there's things that we didn't put on here, but there are events that are things, abuse, emotional, sexual, physical abuse, domestic violence, witnessing violence. So even if you're not the one that's being hit or being beat up or whatever, or being shot at, just witnessing that can be a traumatic event. Bullying, cyberbullying, an institutional abuse. We see that a lot in um, how certain situations are addressed, especially related to gender and race and other situations. Loss, so death, abandonment, neglect. Separation, a child will often feel a lot of um, emotions when parents are going through a divorce. I mean, and the parents feel that too, because there's a loss, there's a separation. Natural disasters, accidents, terrorism, all of these things, and then chronic stressors, such as poverty, racism, invasive medical procedures. If you think about, like, especially if you have an unexpected medical condition, how stressful is that when you don't know what's going on? And then think of it from a child's perspective. I think sort of an older school of thought was that if kids are young enough, they might not remember it, but they do. Even if they don't consciously remember it in their brain, their bodies remember what it was like to be rushed into an ER, to be put on machines, to have a mask put over your face to help with breathing. So sometimes you'll see that later in seeing kids maybe have some behavior issues because they're trying to gain control of their environment. Because there was this time when they didn't have any control and they didn't understand what was happening. So <clears throat> the experiences of trauma are affected by a lot of different factors. So trauma can result from a single devastating event called a single episode or acute trauma. But a lot of people will have what we call complex or ongoing trauma. People who live in power, near the poverty line, people who are dealing with racism or sexism or um, gender discrimination. Um, most people um, that are served in the public system, which is what I spent most of my career in to this point, working in community mental health, have a lot of complex traumas. They not only had acute traumas, but then they had ongoing traumas that have affected their development. Trauma can be unintentional, as when an organization does harm through its procedures. For example, the routine practice of undressing for medical exams can re-traumatize a person. So if you think about it, if somebody has been traumatized sexually and they go to a doctor's office and they're like, take off your clothes and put on this skimpy gown that, you know, the doctor can, so the doctor can examine you, that can be really scary. And sometimes that person might, like I said, they might not even know why that's affecting them so much. Systems can also <clears throat> unintentionally replicate the dynamics of an earlier trauma, causing re-traumatization. And trauma can incur from hearing about, watching, or interacting with others who have had traumatic experiences. So I work in a field where I hear some pretty awful stories, um, and I will not share them ever, partially because those are those people's stories, not my own. But I hear them, and I, I would worry about myself if I was not affected by them. If I did not sometimes go home and say, I need to just go sit by myself for a while, or I need to watch a funny TV show. Um, because working in this field, you are hearing those things all the time. And I think that's where I really learned how prevalent trauma is, not just in um, low-income communities and other, um, other different marginalized people. Trauma is prevalent in all ages, races, and socioeconomic classes. It just might look a little different. So how, when, where, and how often all affect our experience of trauma. So it's something if one person experiences a car accident, they might feel traumatized, nervous about getting in a car. But if their life is pretty much 
safe other than that, they probably are going to have an easier time recovering from that trauma. But if somebody is in a car accident and they go home and they're blamed for it and their family is not supportive and they don't have the resources to deal with it, then that is going to cause more ongoing trauma. So this is a question that it says to pause for discussion, but like I said, I want to kind of push through some of this, but I'd love for you to think about this and we can talk about it at the end, but how can the, the same event be traumatic for one person and not for another? So just kind of think about that as we go through the rest of this presentation. The effect of trauma on an individual can be thought of as a normal response to an abnormal situation. So if you think about what happens when a person is traumatized, um, the causes can, the, there's short and long-term effects that can be caused by this. So um, trauma can affect an individual's coping response or ability to engage in relationships, or it can interfere with mastery of developmental tasks. So if someone, especially if someone goes through a trauma at a very young age, there may be ways that they seem very immature, but it's because that development was halted or slowed down because of that trauma. And that can be both physical and emotional development. Trauma may affect an individual's physiological responses, psychological well-being, social relationships, and or spiritual beliefs. So one thing to consider is that when someone goes through a trauma, we tap into this fight or flight response, which we'll get more into a little bit later. But if someone doesn't know how to calm that response down and reset and turn that off in their body, that's going to start to wear on their body because their heart's always going to be beating a little faster. Their muscles are always holding a little more tension. And if you just think about that, that's going to wear down their bodies. And that's where we get other health issues, not just social emotional issues. So factors that increase the impact of trauma are early occurrence. So usually the earlier a trauma happens, the more it affects somebody. Because kids are so young when they experience things, they don't have all of the references to put things in perspective to help them work through it. Um, blaming or shaming. If you come in, if you're in a situation where maybe you you fall and scrape your knee, and instead of saying, "Oh my gosh, you were hurt," the person says, "Well, why were you running? Or why did you fall?" That you know, that's going to be like, "Okay, I can't fall anymore because I, you know, I'll get hurt." Um, the perpetrator, if the perpetrator is a trusted caregiver, so if the abuse is from a person and it's somebody who's supposed to be trusted, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt and uncle, a family friend, that can make that trauma even more profound because then they start to doubt who they can trust and who they can't trust. And being silenced or not believed. So, you know, we've learned a lot about this with the Me Too movement and, and all of that, that so often we, we talk about a traumatic event and pe people are like, oh, well, that wasn't that big a deal, or why are you still bringing this up? And those are all things that can make that trauma more intense and that impact. So I'm going to just give you some numbers of the prevalence of trauma, because I think a lot of times when we think about trauma, we think about it as happening to somebody else, when really most people have experienced some trauma in their life. So more than 84% of adults um, of mental health clients have trauma histories. So. A very high percentage of people served in the mental health se setting have potentially traumatizing events as children or as adults. One thing that I found when I would do assessments when I would first be meeting a new patient is I would ask, well, have you had a traumatic experience? I wouldn't ask specifically, and a lot of times they would say no. But then we would talk some more, and I'd be getting a family history, and then they'd start telling me about something that happened, like a parent 
having um, schizophrenia or, you know, and seeing their, the results of that not being managed or witnessing domestic violence or stuff. And I'm like, and, and I sit there and think, well, those are traumas. Those are things that cause us to have those fight or flight responses. So exposure to traumatic events increases the likelihood that people will use more mental health services and need more intensive interventions. Um, these statistics are so high that many mental health settings assume that every person they see have had some form of trauma in their background, whether anyone knows about it or not. So, and that is part of like the underlying ethos of trauma-informed care is to assume that everyone you meet has had trauma. And it's not to see trauma everywhere, but it's in hopefully when we react to a person, we can react to them with more compassion instead of becoming defensive or angry at a person. So 84%, as I said, of adults and mental health, adult mental health clients have histories of trauma. 50% of females and 25% of male clients have experienced sexual assault in adulthood. Um, content of hallucinations and delusions are often based on memories of childhood traumas. And children who grow up in poverty are seven times more likely to develop schizophrenia. So those are just some of the statistics. I honestly could stay up here all day and just list out the statistics about different populations and how trauma affects them. But we do want to have the rest of our Sunday. So um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is <coughs> something that's called the ACEs study. So it's adverse childhood experiences against adult status on average a half century later. So back in 1985, Dr. Felitti, um, who worked for um, Kaiser Permanente, uh, had an obesity clinic. And he was getting curious about why patients dropped out of treatment or gained the weight back. He did home visits and concluded that there were 10 reoccurring areas of childhood problems which led to adults not succeeding with their weight loss. So this all started in an obesity clinic. So he joined a guy named Bill Onda from the CDC and they started this study. Now I started learning about this when I was in graduate school for social work. So this is common knowledge for most social workers, but outside of the social work and mental health field, even in other health professionals, this is not always talked about. So researchers surveyed more than 17,000 insured individuals from 1995 to 1997 about their history of ACEs. So there was a 10 question questionnaire about uh, if they've witnessed violence, if they have experienced you know, a traumatic accident, if, they, if their parents have been through divorce, if parents used substances or had mental health issues, um, and a few other questions in there. Um, this is one of the largest ongoing health risk studies that established that this relationship between trauma exposure and physical health, it is organized by the Centers of Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente. So this is still an ongoing study. A lot of agencies and organizations will collect this information and send it in and it'll continue to be compiled. So the ACEs study uses an ACEs score from one to 10. So basically for each, a question you answer yes to, that's one point. Um, so one thing that's important to remember is um, these are the thing, these are what ACEs experiences are. So if somebody has a recurrent and severe physical abuse, sexual abuse, someone abusing alcohol or drugs in their family, um, a family member being imprisoned, parents who are separated and divorced, mentally ill, chronically depressed or, depressed or institutionalized family members, mother being treated violently, both biological parents are absent, or emotional or physical abuse. So those are all the different categories they used. Um, so a couple of things to recognize about this is that the first 17,000 HMO members who were interviewed were middle class people with jobs and medical insurance not likely to have been exposed to street violence, extreme poverty, malnutrition, dislocation, 
natural disaster, disaster or war or terror. <clears throat> and in, the, in that population, so those are people like us, not people, you know, they're not the people who are struggling around the poverty line that are utilizing the community mental health system. One in four exposed, were exposed to at least two categories of ACEs. One in 16 were exposed to at least four categories. 22% were sexually abused as children, and 66% of women experienced abuse or violence in, in their childhood. So those are some pretty profound numbers. This is an epi this is, these are epidemic proportions, um, and it indicates a need to address this on a public health level. So, as ACEs increase, the risk for all of these health problems increase basically at a one-to-one -one ratio. So, we kind of see four as the number where we start to consider somebody at high risk for a lot of different concerns. But if somebody has a seven or an eight ACE score, they're going to be at more risk for all of these, these concerns. And I'm not going to list them all out. But, um, But this is sort of a picture of the concept of how adverse childhood experiences can lead to early death. So you have the experience, it disrupts neurodevelopment, which then disrupts social, emotional, and cognitive development, which then oftentimes people adopt um, high-risk behaviors, which lead to disease, disability, and social problems, which then often leads to early death. So the emotional problems, two-thirds um, or 67% of all suicide attempts, 64% of adult suicide attempts, and 80% of childhood and adolescent suicide attempts are attributable to adverse childhood experiences. Women are three times more likely as men to attempt suicide, but men are four times as likely as women to complete suicide. I think the um, method men use tend to be more violent methods, which is why they often tend to complete. Um, adults with an ACE score of four or more are 460% more likely to be suffering from depression. So this bar graph actually probably underestimates chronic depression in men because men tend to be more covert in disclosing their feelings of depression. A recent study of men found 85% to be suffering from something that we call alexithymia, which is a new category of um, depression that's in our new Diagnostic and Stat Statistics Manual. Um, the likelihood of adult suicide attempts increased 30-fold or 3,000% with an ACE score of seven or more. Childhood and adolescent suicide attempts increase 51-fold or 5,100% with an ACE score of seven or more. This is a hugely significant relationship um, and is rare in epidemiological studies. Suicidal, suicidality may be triggered but is not usually caused by mental illness, drugs, rejection, by peers, school pressure, or failures. Rather, it's an attempt to cope. It's a way to manage or escape from the overwhelming impacts of adverse childhood experiences and adult or adult trauma. It's easier to get a seven aces than you might think. In a family where there's domestic violence, for example, there often exist additional problems that are categories in the aces, such as substance abuse, separation, divorce, abandonment, physical abuse, sexual abuse, someone in the correctional system, serious emotional problems, depression, emotional abuse, and neglect. Once an individual experiences one ACE, it opens him or her up and creates fragility that compromises their resiliency, like an immune system that gets compromised. This is part of the story of what happens. We may <clears throat> keep ourselves socially or even professionally safe 
or acceptable by not looking at childhood experiences, but we, ad we have to address suicide. So there's also impaired memory of childhood. So oftentimes people, um, I had recently had somebody who was like, I don't remember my childhood at all. They couldn't tell me if it was good or bad. They just don't remember it, which is a red flag for me thinking, okay, well, something may have happened that allows that their body and their mind is trying to protect them. Health risk behaviors, so these are just a few. I'm gonna kind of speed through some of these um, in the interest of time. Um, a male child with an ACE score of six has a 4,600% increase in the likelihood that they may become an IV drug user when compared to a child, a male child with no ACEs. So this could be a number of reasons. It may be how their family has coped with difficulty, but it can also be um, how they're trying to figure out how to not have some of the feelings that they're having. Um, these are some statistics about smoking. So uh, a child with six or more category, six or more ACEs is 250% more likely to become an adult smoker. A person with four ACEs is 260% more likely to have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, a person, a, there's a 500% increase in adult alcoholism that is directly related to adverse childhood experiences. Two thirds of all alcoholism can be attributed to adverse childhood experiences. So when we start to look at people and their actions and we get frustrated with their choices, sometimes instead of thinking again, what's wrong with you, you wanna think about what happened to you. So these are, 78% um, um, uh, of drug injections by women can be attributed to ACEs. So just some more statistics. Again, we wanna move to what's ha what, from what's wrong with you to what's happening to you. So in a clinical setting, it's often what is your diagnosis? But so, and that's another way of saying what's wrong with you. Instead, <clears throat> so the, and what are your symptoms and how can I best help or treat you? Instead, we wanna say, what is your story? How did you end up here? How have you coped and adapted? How can we work together to figure out what helps? So it's a way of reorganizing your thinking when you're approaching someone who seems to be having difficulty. And you wanna think, how do I understand this person rather than how do I understand their problems or symptoms? So developmental factors, the disruption of developmental tasks in childhood can result in adaptive behaviors which may be interpreted, interpreted as mental health symptoms. So, but really it's a way of someone trying to, like I said before, regain control or self-soothe. So section two is about how trauma affects a whole person. So adaptive responses when we're overwhelmed. So this is almost kind of startling to look at but probably when you look at this list of what you see, probably a lot of the problematic and behavior, there's a lot of problematic behaviors and diagnoses. Each one of these is a trauma related response. So if we see someone who is always worried about what's happening next or what's going on around them, that's something we call hypervigilance. And that is often a response to trauma. People who have eating disorders it can also be a response to trauma. A lot of things we see as self-destructive behaviors are responses to trauma. So additional signs of trauma are flashbacks or frequent nightmares, sensitivity to noise or being touched, always expecting something bad to happen, not remembering periods of your life, feeling emotionally numb, lack of concentration or irritability, excessive watchfulness, anxiety, anger, shame, or sadness. Now, none of these are always associated with trauma. 
As I was saying earlier, it might look different in one person than another, but these are all signs of trauma. So I'm going to talk a little bit about brain development. The brain has a bottom-up organization. The bottom region controls most of our functions like respiration, heart rate, and blood pressure. Um, some people call that our primitive brain. <clears throat> the top areas of contr control more complex functioning, such as thinking and regulating emotions. At birth, human brains are not developed. The part of our brains that control the breathing and all of those basic autonomic functions are, is working, but all of the thinking and the understanding is not developed. And I think many people here have raised children and have seen that, seen how they develop. So at birth, as I said, the brain is not fully developed. During childhood, the brain matures um, and develops these capabilities. The development of the brain during infancy and childhood follows this bottom-up structure. So as they're growing, things start making more connections in their brain, moving up and working towards the frontal lobe. Um, but what happens is if somebody experiences trauma, that development gets altered or halted. And then they start not being able to develop those things that we think of as important for, our, for interacting as human beings. So this is just a little, this kind of shows the parts of the brain, the executive, what we call executive functioning. So that's our problem solving and decision making, the emotional state, and then the survival brain. So that's why lots of times you see young children, they've got their survival brain and they're starting to develop their emotional state, but they haven't quite figured out how to connect that to regulating their emotions. So that's why you get temper tantrums. And actually, there's one, uh, another quick video I'm going to show, and then we will. tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. 
Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. Next pictures kind of just show what our normal processes of thinking and problem solving are. So we observe, we get input, we interpret, we process, we evaluate our options, we plan, and then we act. So that's how we normally address a situation. But what happens when there is a, a life-threatening or traumatic event? We get this bypass where you observe and you interpret, and then you go right to fight, flight, or freeze, and then you act. So you shut off that frontal lobe because you have to survive. And that's normal. That's and that's normal. That is a normal response. So this is going to happen from time to time in everyone's life. But what happens for someone who has PTSD or <clears throat> experience, experiences chronic, chronic traumas or does not learn how to uh, learn skills to help them come back from difficult experiences this alarm system becomes the main superhighway of managing emotions. So instead of, and they almost forget how to do the rest of it, they forget how to problem solve, or they never learn that if it happens early enough in their life. So these are just important things to keep in mind and to understand when somebody is having a reaction that just doesn't fit what you think the situation calls for. Um, Again, it's a bottom-up reaction to fear. So we get that alarm system. The area of the brain responsible, so sometimes people will get so scared they can't talk. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced that. And part of that is because speech happens in the Broca's area. And um, a lot of times when somebody's brain goes into that fight or flight mode, that area gets shut off. That's why we become speechless. We just, we can't even formulate words in that moment. So, again, we talk about the fight, flight, or freeze response. And it used, they used to just refer to it as the fight or flight response, but I think a lot of people acknowledge that sometimes in a fearful situation we freeze because sometimes not moving will, I think if you go back to like, uh, predator prey days, like some for some prey, not moving will help them disguise themselves from the predator rather than running or fighting. So other possible responses to trauma can be behavioral. So blowing up when being corrected, fighting when criticized or teased, resisting transitions or changes, very protective of personal space, reckless or self-destructive, frequently seeking attention, reverting to our younger behaviors. So nightmares, um, sensitive to noise and sounds, unexplained medical problems. I now work in a program that addresses chronic pain and the connection between chronic pain and trauma is 
very strong. So, and a lot of people who have experienced trauma have, will, will participate in behaviors that might seem reckless or unsafe to us because their brains have not been able to differentiate between what's safe and what is not safe. So, it's important to remember that triggers, that a lot of times people's reactions to triggers are not personal towards us. So we have a little, um, a little reminder of Q-tip, which is quit taking it personally. So, so if somebody's reacting to you or you're like, what's going on here? Think Q-tip, quit taking it personally, because probably it's not about you at all. So healing and recovery. So I'm going to get a little bit into what can we do as a community to address this and to be more sensitive to people with trauma and be more welcoming. Um, we need to realize the widespread impact of trauma, recognize the signs and the symptoms, respond using the knowledge that we have in a compassionate way, and resist re-traumatization. So if we know if we can maybe keep the lights at a lower level, it might help people feel more comfortable. That's something simple we can do. We obviously are not going to be able to predict all of the potential trauma triggers because there's so many different ways a person can be traumatized through smell, through sound, through even just a lighting scheme. Someone can be re-traumatized or it can bring up, bring up that traumatic memory. So a big word that we talk about a lot here is resilience. Um, and this is a person's ability to adapt in recovery and recover even in the face of highly stressful and tra traumatic experiences. And the great thing about resilience is it can be taught. So even if somebody doesn't start out by having resiliency factors, they can, you can teach people how to take a step back, how to get resources, how to make sure they're taking care of themselves and being safe. And just by responding compassionately to somebody, you are helping them build resilience. So resilience is an individual's capacity, but research has shown that high levels of resilience can deliver valuable outcomes for individuals. So helping people to make speedy recoveries from problems. So, and trauma, like we said, is healed in relationships. So the best way to help someone who has had traumatic experiences is to be that helpful, supportive person, to give them a secure place. So there's things, like I said, we can do for sensory interventions, like pay attention to how loud we're talking to someone. Don't go up and hug someone without asking them first, because we don't know what their experience might have been. Of course, we're not allowed to hug each other still, but you know, <laughs> when that's allowed again, ask first. Um, because when we calm the body, we bring the thinking brain back online. So if you can create, if you see someone getting upset and you can help them calm down, then they're gonna be able to think through and get some perspective and, and be able to start engaging those coping strategies. I mean, if you think about when your kids have thrown temper tantrums in the past, you don't try to talk to them about what brought it on right when they're in the midst of their temper tantrum, right? You wait until they're calm, and then you say, okay, let's, let's talk about this because this was not okay, and then hopefully they'll start to understand what are appropriate behaviors. So we can kind of consider this universal precautions. So some of, most of you may be familiar with the idea of universal precautions like washing your hands, wearing a mask in many situations, um, putting on gloves if you're dealing with bodily fluids. I work in hospitals, so they review these with us a lot. Those are all universal precautions. When we think about universal precautions for dealing with trauma, it's doing things like respecting people's personal space, you know, paying attention to how we're approaching people, being aware of if somebody reacts in a different way than we expect, instead of getting defensive or getting angry ourselves, trying to calmly react to that. So those are all good universal precautions. And it can be different in different situations. So faith communities need to know about trauma and its impacts. Because there's probably many people in our community that have experienced traumas. And we don't know about it, and we don't have to know about it to care for it. So 
We can care through relationships, our spiritual practices, and our outreach. So relationships. Jesus showed us that creating relationships with everyone. Jesus created the relationships with people who a lot of the society did not think were worthy of relationships at that time. But he created those, and through those relationships, that's how his movement kept going. Um, so if we approach things with empathy and kindness. So like if we have a potluck and different things that help buy, form our community and bind us together, those are all things that can help build resiliency, to help someone feel safe. I have to say one of the resiliency factors in my life was being raised in the church. It's not the same, that's not true for everybody. But my experience was that I learned that there is this large extended family of people, not even just in Toledo, but across Ohio, because my parents did Curcios, um, that they know who I am and they care about what happens to me. And if I really needed assistance, they would be there to help me. And that is something that a lot of people are not raised with. And some people in some churches don't have those experiences. They may feel judged or like somehow they're doing something wrong or they have brought on their situation because they were sinning. And I feel like our community understands that everyone sins and grace is what joins us all together. Our spiritual practices, such as meditating, praying, and singing when we're allowed, um, can also be soothing. I also studied music therapy for a while, and there's aspects of music that help create new pathways in the brain, and those things are all helpful. So just making sure we're being conscious and sensitive to our environment. And our outreach. So welcoming people who are new to our environment, reaching out to people who might not normally consider, um, who might have preconceived notions about a church and religious communities and showing that you can be compassionate and non-judgmental. So in conclusion, trauma is everywhere. Behaviors you, may, you see may be how a person has coped with trauma in the past. Don't take things personally. Your relationships with people can help them heal. Um, modeling calming techniques can help them to develop them. So offering sensory interventions can also be helpful. So maybe if you do see someone getting upset, saying, hey, you want to go over to this quiet room here for a few minutes and calm down, have a glass of water, something like that, those are all things that can be helpful to someone who's struggling to control their emotions um, and the, even their physical responses. Um, and work with the assumption that everyone has trauma. So everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about, so be kind. So these are some resources for more information. Um, ACE is too high and ACE's connections can talk more about ACE's. Um, and then the Lucas County Trauma-Informed Care Coalition. Um, right now we do Zoom meetings. At some point we might go back to meeting in person. But if this is something you're interested in, you're always welcome to come. It's an open meeting. Um, I also want to say, um, if you want to get sort of another perspective on this, there's a great TED Talk on YouTube by Nadine Burke Harris, who I believe is the Surgeon General of California. Um, and she, um, from a medical perspective, has talked about how ACEs are so important to address and how it's really a public health issue that we need to address. So this is my information. You guys all, you just talk to my parents. They know how to find me. Um, we know how to find you. Yeah. <laughs> so are there any questions? I know I, that was a lot. So does anyone have any questions? Did you get any on Facebook? Uh, we don't have any on Facebook at this point. Okay. And that's well, fine. I, one of the things I was just personally remembering, I mean, it's very graphic, but I remember being in a car accident and having that startle response, mm -hmm. you know, the next day. And I, I, I was in tears or I would see a car coming and I'd be, you know, and it, it's just, fascinating to see how quick, I mean, and then it was gone after mm -hmm. a few days, but just, it's so physiological. Mm -hmm. It is. And our bodies remember those things much longer than our conscious brains. 
There's lots of reading. The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk is a book about that. Peter Levine does a lot with what's called somatic experiencing, which doesn't force the person to relive their trauma over and over again, but gives them strategies for when they're feeling reactive, how to manage that and how to deal with it. There's also something called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, I, I have trouble with that one word. Um, so, and I'm actually going to get trained in that in a couple of weeks, so I'm very excited about that. But that is another uh, method that has become more and more popular for addressing trauma. And I think as we're coming out of this pandemic and you know we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel, a lot of people have experienced a lot in the last year and a half. And so if we can keep some of this in mind, and because we, we don't know, not everyone had the resources they needed when they were going through this experience. So we want to remember that as we start interacting in person again and seeing more people. I, I think some of us may think, well, that word can't apply to me because it wasn't so severe. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you just look at, like, mm -hmm. you know, the whole notion of how does it feel to be in a place with or without a mask? Or, mm -hmm. you know, how we're, we've tried to do the right thing and mm -hmm. be safe, and yet it's changing. Yeah. The rules yeah. are changing. You have a question? I'm just curious, how would you address the fact that a lot of what we're talking about is cases have a lot to also do with our genetic component? Mm. Yeah, there is a lot. So there's a lot of research. And like I said, I could probably talk about this all day and do training on this all day. But there is a lot of evidence that the, um, the, especially experiencing ACEs in childhood, but it changes our brain function and it can change how our genes manifest themselves. And some people are born with more predispositions to physical and mental illness. Um, and that's, but the fact is, is that the experience is what can, can affect how those things look in each person. So, Justin. I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak on uh, the recovery process. Like, what are the first steps in the recovery process, and how long does it take for a person to work better? I understand trauma will always probably yeah. be there, uh, but I wonder how long that process is. It's really, I mean, to some extent, it, it really kind of depends on what was the traumatic experience you're addressing, and some people have multiple experiences. Um, <coughs> the evidence-based treatments, such as there's trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, that's about a 12 to 18 session or week, like once if you meet once a week, that's about um, 12 to 18 weeks. And but and obviously, like when you're done with it, it doesn't mean you're done. It just means now you have some tools to help you function better. And I haven't been trained in EMDR yet, so I'm not sure what the timeline generally is for that. But I think a lot of times we have to remember that like you'll learn skills and you'll go through a treatment to address trauma and you'll get some initial relief, but also life happens. So you may have to go back and talk to a therapist if there's something that happens in your life that maybe brings up issues that weren't there when you first went through treatment. But it is something, it's an ongoing thing because you can't erase the trauma. What has been your experience with uh, children who have been traumatized by um, witnessing uh, domestic violence? Um, oh, so many. Uh, most children you see a lot of, like, because I used to work in schools for a while, you, you tend to see a lot of behavior issues. A lot of times those children can be much more aggressive in their reactions and can seem violent because that's what they witnessed, that's what they understand. And they often don't trust adults, um, so it can take a long time to build up trust with children to help them know that they're safe with you and to learn how, to, how they can take care of themselves even if their environment continues to be unsafe. So it's hard, I mean, it's hard to say, but usually with kids it usually manifests in behavior, what we call behavior problems, you know, because they're, that's the only way they have to control their environment. I know the courts are, are greatly concerned about children who witness mm -hmm. domestic violence, and often uh, CSB would intervene mm -hmm. to take that child out of the home. Yeah, and that's because you don't want them to continue to witness violence, if at all possible. And we actually have uh, Connie, is it Connie Zimmerman? She just retired. She was a juvenile court judge. She's part of the Trauma Informed Care Coalition, and so she's done a lot of advocating. Um, within the court system and a lot of education. Sarah? I have a Facebook question. Uh, Jane Larson Lawton asks, is it 
a fairly new thing to have a social worker directly involved in a pain clinic. Yes. <laughs> um, this is the program that I'm actually involved in, so I'm just going to do a little self-promotion here. Um, it's through UTMC and um, University of Toledo Physicians, and this is a new evidence-based program where we address the physical, it's called a biopsychosocial model. So we address the physical and the emotional and other social aspects. So having a social worker involved who can help a person really identify and see how the chronic pain, like what might be some of the causes of the chronic pain, but then also if people experience chronic pain, it's, it's very isolating. There's actually a lot of shame involved. People sometimes feel like they deserve it. So helping them make sense of that and learn some different ways of thinking and having a little more hope. So, we, so we need to wrap up. So, but I'll still be here for a little while. And always feel free if you want to ask me questions. I this is like my I'm very passionate about this topic, so I'm always happy to help people understand it. <coughs> so thank, the, you, thank you guys very much. Thank you.